Good morning. Yeah. So, in case you didn't realise, this presentation's in English. So, I won't be offended if you get up and leave. Um, if, if you don't, if you have trouble with my English, so I apologise now. What a this! I'm not going to. This session is not about me teaching you how to use Joomla. It's about me sharing ideas about how to teach Joomla. So a little bit about myself first. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Tiemann. I'm the co-founder of Joomla. I live in the UK, as you might gather by my accent, but I do seem to travel quite a lot, so I sometimes think I live on British Airways seat 10C. Not Lufthansa, because the last time I came to Germany, Lufthansa went on strike, so I'm never doing that one again. So what is O'Brien? Well, I'm not a coder, um, I'm not a designer either, I'm not a leader, and I'm not a follower. What I am and what I do for a living is teach people and train them, um, not, not just in Joomla and other stuff as well. But I'm also really lucky because I travel the world, talking and talking and talking about my love for Joomla and occasionally my girlfriend. You see, I get the, I get the priorities, right? So what I want to do first of all is find out who you are. Um, who in this room is a site build, builds websites for people? Okay. Who writes extensions for people? Okay. Who manages websites for, within their office or for clients? Okay, a few people. Anybody think that they don't fit into any of those categories? Designer. Designer, okay. Yeah, I don't really count, count designers. They're not important. Uh, <laughs> so, the thing about teaching Joomla, and this applies whether you're teaching uh, people in, in um, clients how to use the website you've built for them or you're teaching uh, someone how to use the code the extension that you've written or how to customize the template that you've designed for them um, every person that you teach is different and some of them are not the brightest in the world um, I have had people who have uh, when I've told them to click on the button they've picked the mouse up and clicked it on the screen um, it does happen. I, when I'm teaching people, I try, I've found over the years that the best way is to make a friend out of them. And when you make a friend out of them, instead of you telling them what to do, you're helping them. And instead of it being just sort of, it's just, I'm not standing there saying, you do this, you do this, you do this. It becomes much more of a fun activity. And that's one of the really important things I've learned. I mean, it's a long time since I was at school, but there were a lot of lessons where I would just sit there and the teacher would talk and it would just go in and out. But the teacher that was fun and engaging and involved us all was the one that I listened to, and the one that I enjoyed. And the subjects that I enjoyed were the ones I did better at. And it wasn't because I was more the subjects were better, teachers were better, it was the style. So I always find that it's best to make a friend. To make a friend of, of yourself, and yes, it's a business relationship, but when you, if you want to be successful in teaching them how to use it, you've got to make friends with them. Now the other thing that's really important is to keep it short and sweet. You can, I've had people come to me and said they want to book me for five days of Joomla training. Now apart from the excitement to me of five days worth of money and not one day, um, I don't know what I could teach you in five days because if I, it takes me five days to do it, it's too long, it's too boring. Keep everything short and sweet. The shorter it is, the less they got, to, you know, the less they have to remember. And there's, you don't have to teach them everything. If you, those of you that are more familiar, some of, some of you may be fairly new to Jumma, so it may not 
make sense. But on a lot of the screens in Joomla, there are a million options. I never, when I'm teaching Joomla, tell people what those options are. I only tell them about the options that they need to change. In fact, I have a little video called Don't Touch It to remind them, if Brian didn't tell you to touch it, don't worry about it, you don't need to touch it. Yeah? They're not for you, they're for the other people. You only need to look at the stuff that's important for you. Don't start, right, we now need to create a new module and here are the 74 different options that you could apply for this module. They're not interested. They only need to know what they need to know. Let them, exp when they feel more confident with it, they can explore those on their own later. But just keep it short and sweet. The other thing is building it up slowly. If I want to teach you how to create an article in Joomla, what's going to go in that article? Words, web links, pictures, maybe some bullets, some formatting, lots of different things. If I want to sit down with you and write, okay, we're going to write this article and we start typing and then we format this to make a bullet link and then we're going to add some web links and then we're going to add some links to other articles and then we're going to add some pictures and then we're going to look and save it and see what it's done. They've lost the connection. Break it up into short, short bits. This is an article we can put some text in. Save, have a look. This is, we, we're going to insert an image now. Click on the insert image button, put the image in, save, have a look. You're breaking it down into little bits. It's also called the reward system. Because every time you do something, you can see what happened. You've got a reward for doing it. Yeah? It's a bit like getting a sweetie, a sweetie or a gold sticker, you know, from the teacher. It's, you're getting, you're getting acknowledgements that you've done something. Now, I have done a series of training videos on Joomla uh, for SiteGround. Um, they're freely available for anybody who don't need to be a SiteGround customer. The longest, there's I think 25 videos, how to build a Joomla website. The longest video is six minutes. The average, of, of about, there are, most of them are about three to four minutes. Because you watch it, you do it, you see the results, woohoo, move on. <coughs> Yesterday, I followed a link to somebody else offering free Joomla training videos, 26 lessons. I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder if they've stolen mine. Um, and so I clicked on the link and I went to YouTube and I started watching the first one. And I was carrying on doing some work at the same time. And I got distracted. And then I realized this video was still playing. And I looked, and this was video one, and it was 110 minutes. So YouTube does a really nice thing. It shows you the analytics. So I actually looked to see, I know on my videos that the first video has more visitors than the second video than the third. And by the, the last video, it's, it's got a lot less because people are more confident. This guy has a lot for the first video and almost none for the second video because it's too long. People are not interested. Do you really want to sit down and watch a mini series in order to just create an article? It's too much. So keep it short and sweet and build everything up slowly. Don't try and teach them everything at once. And as I said before, most importantly, keep it fun. The funnier it is, the more, the more you enjoy teaching, the more the students or the clients will enjoy learning. And that works when it's just one-to-one, -one, but also when you're doing videos or documentation. Yeah? The really good, some of the really good documentation websites you go to, they've got a sense of humour. You can see it. So there's two types of documentation that we can do. Printed and videos. Yeah, or written and video. So I'm going to talk about writing to them first. Writing documentation is boring. Yeah, it's not very exciting. But there's a couple of different types of documentation. And before you start writing, you need to decide what it is that you're writing. There's the reference guide. 
The reference guide is where you discuss everything. It is the one where you have the page and you describe absolutely what every single option does. You just describe, just literally describing it. If you go, to, a good example of that is the Joomla help sites. Yeah, the help screens, they just say this button does this, these are the options. This button does this, these are the options. It doesn't explain why or why you would want to use it. It just technically says what it is. But a training guide is something very different. With a training guide, you've all, you're not describing the process. You're describing how to achieve something. You're describing, you say, in my, in my videos, for example, I'm building a, a small website for a cafe. So my articles that I'm creating are about the products that we, that we have in the cafe. The contact page that I want to create is how to find the cafe. It's not click on contacts and there's an address field and there's a name field and there's a telephone field. Yeah. It's make it so that the client, the person reading the documentation, knows what it is that they're going to achieve. And importantly as well, it's so that they can know where, what, when they look at your documentation, when you get an index or a list of things, they're looking for how to find, how, do, how can I tell people where I am? That's what they're coming to your website looking for. They're not, how do I build a contact form or, or how do I use the, the Joomla contact components? They're approaching it from a different, different end. So you have to make sure that you, when you're writing your material, you do that as well. And help and FAQs is a sort of a subset of both of those. They're the, quite often, if you get, in, I find, if you have people who are regularly asking you the same question, you need to document it. And if, if, and if you say to me, but I've already documented it in my 900 page reference guide, it's because they can't find it. So just put the most common questions in the, tip, in the help and FAQ, something like that. Now, who knows a Kiva backup? Yeah? A lot, most people. It's a big backup component, written by a good friend of mine. He won't mind me saying this. This is the table of contents for the documentation for a Kiva backup. Just the table of contents. It actually comes to 200 and something pages, if you print it, the, the entire documentation. I regularly get on Skype to Nicholas and say, how do I do this? And he said, Brian, read the fine manual. And I go, I've read the manual, Nicholas, it's not there. He says, yes, it is. Go to page 27, th a third of the way down, and you'll find it. And when I do find it, yes, it is there. The problem is, it was buried in 280 pages, so I didn't see it. And, more often, the title that he used made sense to him as a programmer. That wasn't the terminology that made sense to me as a user. And for the things that I searched for in that document, it didn't get any hits. It is there, but it's too much. So again, it's the same as before. Keep it short and sweet. And think about not writing it to explain every little step and why you decided to make that a, va a var char instead of a, a fixed, an integer. Just how will you use this? What do you need to know? If it's documentation that's going on the screen as opposed to documentation that you're going to print out, you need to drastically reduce the amount of work that you write. We read far less on screen than we'll do on paper. Um, there's a, a usability expert called Steve Krug, who's written a book called Don't Make Me Think, uh, which is an excellent book. Uh, in fact, it's an excellent example of everything that I'm talking about, because it's funny and it's got cartoons, and the whole book takes you about three hours to read, um, as opposed to three, three weeks. So it's very good. And what he says is, write your content save it, go and have a coffee or a cigarette or whatever it is that you do, come back and edit it by half. And then do it again and edit it by half again. 
and then you've got about the right number of words for the screen. Some of you might know I, write, I have a blog which I write on occasionally. The articles that I look at, that I've written, which are really, 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 really long, are still only about 450 words. But they look really, really long. And a lot of people don't read those because they get to that and they go, oh, that's too long. So you really do read a lot less on screen than you do um, when it's written down. So if it's going to be something on screen, really think about how much you need to write. And a big block of text, no one's interested in reading. And of course, don't just use words, use pictures. Whoops, go back. With pictures, I mean screenshots, images, stuff that people can see. One of the issues with screenshots is we have a tendency to always zoom in. And we have a tendency to cut things out and stuff like that. Really think about it. And I've got a slide uh, in a bit. And we'll, you'll see how, how better to use it. Whoops. I've probably got the slide later. So in the wrong place. So I'll talk about it now. There's lots of tools of software you can use to take screen captures. Yeah, I'm sure you've all got your own favorite one, or there's just the ones built into your operating system. The best ones are the ones that, when, for, for the purposes of documentation, are the ones that allow you, after you've taken the screenshot, to immediately add a label, put some arrows onto it. Let's do it there and then. Yeah? There are some quicker screenshot tools. You just press a button, screenshot, saves it. You move on, screenshot, save it. And then you have to open up all those images later and add arrows and labels and stuff. And you forget. You forget, why did I take this screenshot? You forget what it is. So it's much better to do it right there and then. Yeah, um, I'm using one right now called Undersoft Capture. But I think that's, for the, it's, I think that's a Mac only one. Um, but there are lots of others, and there's lots built into browsers that you can use. Find one you like and, and, and learn how to use it. But when you've got that screenshot, if you, if you wanted to show how to use one part, and obviously it's only probably one small part of the screen, if you only ever show pictures of just that cutouts, uh, from my experience, a lot of users go, where is that? They can't find it on the screen. So maybe think about having one big picture first and later on break it down into the smaller ones because they really you'd be amazed at how often people just haven't got a clue where something is um, my favorite way of doing training is not documenting it's producing videos for me it works i found that the response from from people has been much greater from videos that I've created than it ever was from documentation that I've done. With videos, as with anything in life, using the best tools will really make a big difference. There's two sides to the video. Um, first of all, the software. There are lots of, lots of software, some of it even free, that will do screen recordings. There's some really good ones that will do screen recordings. I've got about four or five of them on my laptop that do it for free. The problem is they just record your screen and maybe your voice, but they don't have any editing capabilities. So you will spend all your time, delete that one, start again. Delete that one, start again. It'll take you a long time. There are two really good video editing uh, tools that for Mac and Windows, Camtasia and ScreenFlow. Um, personally, I use ScreenFlow. Um, I think it works slightly, they work slightly differently to each other. It works the way I like it, but I did try both for a while. The big thing about it, of course, is it's a proper timeline video editor. So I record the screen, it puts the audio and the video into tracks, and I can cut and split and edit and reuse stuff. Um, makes life really easy. When I'm recording a video, I 
Some people, what they do is they write a script, record the script, then record the video and put the two together. Um, most of the time, I do the videos live. And actually, I, I work out what I want to do, and then I do it live and record it live. And if I make a mistake as I'm doing it, I just pause myself and then start again. And then it's really easy just to open up the edit. When, it, when it's in the editor, I can then just find the, find the gaps and cut them out. It really makes a ma it massively reduced my recording time by doing that. So there's the software, but there's also the hardware. Um, you don't need a particularly powerful computer to do videos nowadays. Uh, you used to do. It's not now. The only difference is, is how long it takes to actually render the video at the end. Um, but this is a couple of years old MacBook Air, and it does it more than, more than good enough. The best investment you can make is a real microphone. The microphone built into your computer sucks. Um, this one, this is a USB one from AK, AKG. Um, it cost me about 100 euros. Um, it weighs a ton. Um, it's the best money that I spent. It, the quality is so much better. I uh, did some videos two days ago, and by accident, the cable fell out. I didn't notice. And so when it, I listened to the recording, it was really bad. And it would picked up the, the microphone on my laptop had come in and said, and realize how, what a big difference it is. And nobody wants to watch a video where there's crackling or background noise or anything. And by using a mic these microphones, are, um, they pick up the, la the stuff that's really close, whereas the ones in your laptop, they pick up all the noise around, all the ambient noise as well. Um, and you don't want phones going off in the background or people opening doors or children crying. So that, uh, get yourself a really good microphone and get some of these good headphones. Not in-ear headphones, but proper old-fashioned cup ones. Makes a big difference. You, can, you, you will actually hear stuff in the background if there is anything. You'll know if it's not going to be good before, long before you've rendered it, put it on YouTube and listened back to it. So it's worth spending the money on, on those two things if you're going to do it. It's also, yeah. So some tips about actual recording. Um, I record everything at 1280 by 720. Why? First of all, that's, that is the HD definition. Second of all, that ratio is the default ratio now on YouTube. And when you click full screen to watch any of my videos on YouTube, 1280 by 720, it's not magnifying it. That's, the that's almost the natural size. It can't magnify it. So the quality never goes. How do you do that? Well, one trick that I discovered is I changed the wallpaper on my computer. And I have wallpaper on my laptop that's my normal blue background with a 1280 by 720 green square. And then I know that any app that's within that square is going to get captured on the recording at exactly the right size. Um, for the browser, I got a little utility for my browser to resize the browser to a specific size. But when you tell it to resize your browser to 1280 by 720, it resizes the viewports to 1280 by 720. And if you want to capture the URL bar or the title bar, that's not in that area. So you have to sort of, I've done a, a bit of jiggery pokery, worked out exactly how many pixels it is on my screen. And, and I've done a custom resize button, which I think is probably 1280 by 810. And that captures the, uh, the bar as well. So this is what I was talking about with zooming. In a lot of videos, when you're watching them, every time the cursor moves, they <laughs> zoom in. They have a big trailing thing following the cursor. Uh, the, the cursor is no longer a pointer, it could be a big circle. You know, the, the, the editing tools think that's a really great utility and they will do that for you if you, if you turn it on. 
or when you click on something, it glows so the, the person watching the video knows that you've clicked on it. They're not stupid. If you're showing them a button and you put your cursor on the button and you say, click here, they know you've clicked on it. They don't need this distraction. And it is a distraction. I've watched video, I, I started off doing this. I thought it was great, I would zoom in on everything so you could always see it. And I got headaches watching it. It was hard work to watch it because you're focusing, your, your eyes are having to focus in and out as well as this. I only zoom in now if there's something that you absolutely have to read and it's just too small. So it's very, very rare that I zoom in or do any tricks at all. Almost all my videos are full screen recordings. Um, you also will never see my face on them in a little video window in the corner. Yeah? It's really not very interesting. It's okay for a presentation like this, perhaps, but where the slides you know, are not that active. But when you're teaching someone, they don't need to see the face. Yeah, the, vo the voiceover is good enough. Um, my favourite and most pop uh, successful thing that I discovered was subtitles. And adding subtitles to the videos. They, there's two reasons. And I subtitle everything that I do now. Um, well, more than two reasons. One reason, obviously, those subtitles could then be translated. So yes, your interface is still going to be in English or still going to be in German, but somebody could translate the subtitles and they can get the, the basics of what you're doing because they've got a copy of the software in, in front of them and if they're following clicking in the same places, they will see. So that makes a big difference. The other thing I discovered with subtitles, um, because mine are just subtitled in English. I think some of the site ground ones are now in Spanish as well, but for the, I think I'm the only person, in, oh, Michael as well at the back, who are native English speakers. It's our first language. The rest of you, it's your second, third, fourth language. Quite often, just having the words on the screen as well can help. You know, uh, if you, you might miss something that I speak, I might use a phrase or a, my accent, or something, if you've got the subtitles turned on as well, it can help. Um, the other thing subtitles do is a nice little side effect. Um, if you using um, YouTube subtitles, for example, that's text. So Google likes text, doesn't it? It indexes things on text. It doesn't index audio yet, but it does index text. So every time you subtitle your videos, you're getting SEO value. So I can see, a, see a, few, a few people making notes on that one. Yeah, I didn't realize that one. And uh, someone showed me a video and said, look, I'm number one. And I went, but that's crap. That video is terrible. And he said, well, work it out, why? And it uh, took me ages to discover it's because of the subtitles. At the same, um, YouTube does have a feature now. It automatically, if it detects English, will create subtitles for you. They're very interesting, to say the least. Um, unpublish those. They're, it, even if you're not going to put your own subtitles on, it's better that someone doesn't use the YouTube ones. Um, I use this software to do it. It's free open source software. I, there are lots of different subtitling packages out there, and I think I probably installed and bought about 40 of them. I was not happy with any of them until I stumbled across this one, and it works. It just does it. You automatically, you press enter, it creates a block. You can see where that block is on the timeline, so you can hear, and you can hear gaps, and you can move things around. You just type in your words, hit enter, it creates the new block, and you keep going. Um, I've, the last, I reckon it takes me about 25 minutes to subtitle a five minute video. That's definitely worth the effort. Um, the way it works is it produces, there's lots of different text file formats for subtitling. Um, Jubbler supports all of them. Um, YouTube will import all of them, but, so the other, but some of the other video platforms only support certain ones. 
Um, but this will export them all, and it's really easy. Just one note, do this as the very last thing that you do when you've finished your video. Because if you make any edits to your video, your timeline changes and that changes. And it can be, it does have a, a tool that says, work out what you've, what's been removed and shuffle everything around. It's okay, but it's not brilliant. So, a couple of, I'm going to finish off with, 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 with a few hidden secrets inside Joomla that will make, if you're building websites for clients, or just you're the office manager for your website and you've got other people using it, will make your life easier. The first one, most people don't know this, on the help menu, you can see I have an extra help link there. It says Brian's help. Who's seen that before? Has anybody used that before? No. Yeah, thought so. Um, have I got this picture? No. If you go to the module manager, select administrator, so you just look at the admin modules and select the menu module, one of the options is display custom help. And you type the link in and you press save. And that happens. Actually, what actually happens is it says custom support forum. I use a language, use the language manager to change that straight. And in fact, I think I might submit a pull request to enable you to do that string at the time. So now you can actually put a link to Brian's SiteGround training videos or your own documentation or any, anything at all. Um, it re reduces those um, support calls. The other one you can do, um, this is the dashboard of my Joomla site. And you can see I've got an article here called Quick Tips on the dashboard, on the landing page of my administrator. And again, it's really simple. It's just an admin module. Um, I'm using custom HTML, but you could use, um, you can import an article um, into there, whatever you want. And what I usually, on a, quite a few sites that I've done, um, I use some of those fancy plugins and they've got really weird syntax. You know, squiggle bracket YouTube, squiggle bracket number, squiggle slash, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. I just make, as I'm building the website and I start to use those, I open up the module and I write it in there. So every time I log in, I've got a note of it and they're all in one place and it's just there as a quick reminder. But you could build something much more complex with links and everything else. The third one is to use the notes field. Who knows about the notes field in module manager or menu manager? A couple of people. There is a field for every menu and every module. It's down on the bottom right and it says, called, it says notes. And if you fill it in, when you're in your, mag, your view, you will see the note being displayed. Now this is particularly useful when, for, for example, for modules, when you have seven modules on your website, all called the same thing, all used on different pages. And you want to edit one, and you have to click on all seven before you find the right one. This way, you just leave a little note for yourself. This is the one that you use when you're on the internal pages. This is the one you use on the front, and it exists for the modules and for the menu items. Yeah, really reduces your time. If you're building sites for clients, use it. Because how many times they ring and say, I want to change this piece of text on the front page and I can't find it. Now they can find it. You can also use it and have done it. Star, 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 do not open or edit this module. Star, star, star. Or turn off your WYSIWYG editor before opening this module. I can see Peter nodding at the back. Um, it really, it, the field is there, use it, and it makes a big difference. You don't need to buy an extra module or component to, to do this. It's built in so you can actually use it. So I've shared a short presentation about 
how I teach Joomla and ideas about things that you can do if you've got to teach Joomla, either teach Joomla or just teach a small part of it, a component or something. Um, questions? Anything? Yes? Okay, um, there are some, t there's, a, there's a thing called Pavlovian responses. Do you, have you heard of it? You know, so if you see someone doing copy and paste from word, slap. <laughs> um, actually, in that specific example, what I, what I do is I install JCE as a replacement editor because it does strip out most of it anyway, if they, if they, do, if they do do it. Um, there, look, there are times, there are some things people will never get. They're just too stupid. Um, I have um, told somebody once, I had somebody once who was having trouble using email um, and I get, in the end gave up teaching them and suggested that they bought some uh, paper and envelopes and postage stamps. Um, there is somebody else, I did do a training session on Joomla uh, for a lady once and I was on the train, train home and I'm already getting help, how do I do this? messages on the train home and by the time I actually got home she said I think you need to come back for another day and I just said no There's, there you have you know there are points where you can't you can't do anything anybody else yeah go on. Yeah. Um, and, and how about the image sizes? again I mean yeah so, so there's a whole th there is a whole thing. Users are idiots and they will do the wrong thing. How much time do you want to spend preventing them doing the wrong thing? By like putting in code and things to prevent them doing the wrong thing, as opposed to teaching them and just repeat repeatedly telling them. So one thing I never do, um, if I'm administering a site for someone um, and I suddenly go to that site one day and I see a, type, a, a typing mistake or I see a formatting mistake or I see an image that's too big. I never go and fix it. I always tell them, you've got the wrong image, the image is too big, you need to resize it, this is how to do it. T take it as a teaching opportunity. If, you, if I fix it for them, they'll never learn. Yeah, so I always do that. Eventually they get it, um, you know, they, 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 although some do take a little bit longer than they should. Um, but not every, I mean, I tend not to put things in place to stop them doing silly things um, unless they've been a repeat offender and they just haven't learned. But I don't do it first. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is one of the problems, yeah, um, if you are doing that level of customization. Um, it's the same if you're doing um, custom ad administrator interfaces as well. Um, it's actually one of the reasons why I'm against having custom admin interfaces. Um, what, yes, there are some, what, the basic principles, though, are still the same for every client, yeah? So, for example, I might, in the editor, remove, I uh, use JCE. For some clients, I might give them the full thing. And for others, I will strip it right back and I won't give them this drop down and that drop down. So yes, their video or their picture in the documentation will look slightly different depending on which client, but I never really show that level of stuff. Yeah, I don't necessarily show um, all of that. The other thing you can do um, which works quite well is, um, well, I've, I've just done it actually with the videos. Um, Akiba Backup's just released some uh, Akiba Backup for WordPress. So I've just finished doing the videos for Akiba Backup for WordPress. Well, obviously every screen looks different because it's got the WordPress around the outside. 
but it still looks the same component, you would have no problem using it if you've used it in Joomla. So all I did was took a screenshot of the WordPress one and stuck it onto the Joomla video. You won't know. Yeah, you can't tell. Um, so you can, and it could be the same with your, if you're doing printed documentation or web articles for your, for your clients, you can do that as well and give, it, give each one a custom link to them. Um, there is a website and um, I've forgotten the actual, it's on my blog and it's, the website is called Jew Manuals, J-O-O-M-A-N-U-L-S and it does um, build your own manual for your clients. I think it costs about 40 euros but that's for the use for the year and then you can go in and so when it talks about creating categories and it says you have a very simple menu and it says, what, what's, what are the sample category names you want me to use? And then when it prints the manual out and does all the screenshots, it uses your input to customize it. And I think it can also say if I'm using TinyMC or JCE. And, you can, and it's branded for yourself as well. It's a, it is a very simple manual. You know, it doesn't cover everything. But, it's, but it's, I, always, I give it to everyone that I'm training. You know, if, here you are. This is a, yeah, a reminder of what we've done. Anybody else got questions? Nothing? Cool. Thank you very much.